So, first of all, what does it mean to be uh, a woman in Europe today? And I have to say, first of all, despite many opportunities, uh, our lives are still being limited simply because we are born as women. Uh, take the pay gap, for example. Women in Europe today are paid, on average, some 16% less than men for doing exactly the same job. So from around 3 o'clock uh, in the afternoon, you work for free. Um, in some EU countries, this is over 25%. But in all member states, there is a gender pay gap that cannot be explained in any other way than that it is actually a gender discrimination. And this wage gap may be closely closing, but so slowly that it will take another 70 years before everyone is paid the same money for the same job. And yet, equal pay for equal right is a right enshrined in the EEC Treaty of 1957 and applicable here since 1973 when Ireland joined the EU. And again, you share this situation with all other member states. Another issue facing women in Europe is how to strike a balance between working life and family life. And childcare facilities in most EU countries are still considered a luxury, not a necessity. And it is usually still the man rather than uh, the woman rather than the man who agrees to stay home with the kids. In addition, women also in Europe do some four hours of housework a day on top of their paid work, and often in addition to looking after elderly parents. So put simply, family life limits a woman's career prospects more than a man's. And again, this is the comparison, uh, thinking that we ought to have equal rights and equal opportunities. A third issue, issue is the, the terrible scourge of, of domestic violence. And statistically, one in three women in Europe will suffer physical or sexual violence in a relationship. One in three women. And many will continue to suffer violence uh, from their former partners even after uh, the breakup. And these issues um, should be much higher on the EU's political agenda, but they are not. Why not? Well, as I said, take a look at any meeting of uh, European leaders, the so-called family photos, and the answer uh, is obvious. Um, they are almost all men. And as long as men, and a majority of men, continue to set the agenda, we can expect women's issues, unfortunately, to be left on the back burner. Of course, it's not all doom and gloom. I'm not here to say that. Uh, Irish membership of the Union has, I think, changed a great deal for, for women. EU legislation has ensured that they should have equal rights in the workplace, rights to equal pay, rights to maternity leave, and protection of self-employed women during pregnancy and motherhood, rights for part-time workers, rights against discrimination. And today, women, uh, as I understood from the statistics, make up 42% of the Irish workforce compared to 27% in 1973 when Ireland joined the European Com uh, Commission. And that is, um, of course, a, a huge uh, change in, in a rather short period of, of time. Uh, and again, this is, uh, it's very important that this is in the legislation, that you have um, the, the laws to protect you and, and to guide also the decision makers. But while the situation of Irish women has improved, the goal of equal opportunity and treatment remains a work in progress. And this is true of Europe as a whole. So these elements and these phenomena we share with women uh, all across uh, Europe. And in the middle of the worst recession since uh, the Great Depression in, in the 30s, more women than ever before risk being made redundant. And I remember this from the last time I was here, meeting women who pointed that out. And particularly those in part-time, low-earning jobs, uh, and they are more likely to be affected, of course, in a downturn. 
So the challenges Europe's women are facing now may not be new, but I think they have become much more acute. Uh, and if you are the only one um, earning an income in a family, and maybe you have only you, you being a single mother or um, uh, having only a part-time job and being put off, of course, this is uh, very, very difficult. And that's what women described the last time I was here. In these difficult economic times, people's concerns about their future, and particularly uh, those of women, are, are greater. And the EU has uh, stepped up its efforts to help businesses and ordinary people as well weather the storm by injecting more than 500 billion euros into the European economy to uh, stimulate demand, create jobs, and also boost welfare protection. And the ECB, uh, as you know, is providing loans of some 900 billion euros, 130 billion of which will go to Irish-based financial institutions. And this is uh, almost 77% of Irish GDP. So it's a lot of money uh, that hopefully will, will help the situation. Despite these uh, concrete efforts, um, there are fears in, in this country that the Lisbon Treaty may compound current problems by sweeping away hard-earned rights and, and freedoms. And I guess that this was also the background to, to your question and to this uh, meeting. And uh, there are some myths around as well, I've noticed. And I can assure you, for example, that setting of the minimum wage, and I saw this on the posters getting here, that setting of minimum wage rates is a national responsibility and will remain so. Um, uh, but there are other also more serious concerns. Um, people point to the rulings in recent years of the European Court of Justice on posted workers as proof that Europe does not pretend uh, workers' rights or promote uh, a social agenda. And as a social democrat, um, I have, uh, of course, defended these rights uh, through my whole political career as a commissioner, a Swedish minister, and also an MP. And, and I can say this, I, I share the concerns of working people in this country and in, in Europe about the, the implications and the effects of the court uh, judgments. I would prefer um, that we review certain European laws to make sure that we maintain the right balance between the single market and the rights of all workers to decent wages and, and living conditions. And we absolutely have to avoid a kind of race to the bottom uh, that could destroy the European social uh, model. But the new treaty can help us to do that uh, because the Charter of Fundamental Rights will be a legally binding part of it. And that helps us to, to do exactly that, to weigh up uh, also on the legislation. The Charter will be also legally binding, as well as what uh, is in the treaty on establishing a free trade and a free market and an open, an open market. Uh, and this is indeed very, very important, an important step forward. I want to quote John Monks, because I know that he was here recently also, and he's the, the Secretary General of the European trade unions and when he spoke to the trade unions here in July <clears throat> he said we support ratification of the Lisbon Treaty and I hope the Irish people approve it. We don't say it delivered all what we wanted by a long chalk. It missed some opportunities to reinforce social Europe but we also said that it was a step toward, uh, forward compared to existing provisions for example in relation to the legal enforcement of the Charter of Fundamental Rights commitments to full employment, the social market economy, and public services. Do you really think that the trade union movement across Europe would uh, support the treaty if it was a step backwards for, for social rights? And I know John uh, well enough also that, that uh, I could say they, they would not. And uh, I think he has done a very honest assessment of what is in the treaty.